All right. Hey, again, good afternoon. Thank you all for being here. Um, I asked for this call to be set up um, so that uh, the 128T Juniper guys can brief us a little bit on details, technical details of how their technology, their protocol works as we consider how we want to migrate or move along in this journey of modernizing our infrastructure for warfighting networks and all. And so before we really jump into it, though, uh, there are a number of folks here who uh, whose names are new to me and I'm sure are new to you as well. So if you don't mind, uh, if we could go down the list and um, and just have you introduce yourself of what organizations you're with and what your interest is in this technology, perhaps. Uh, so I'll, I'll start. I'll kick it off and we'll start down uh, the list I have here. Uh, so Peter Cho, I'm a part of the um, SAF AQ, CAO office, chief architect's office. I work for Preston Dunlap. And one of the charges that he's given me to do is to assemble a team to see how we modernize our warfighting network for both Zipper, JWICS, uh, BICES, SAPSAR, Centrix, and all, all the networks that um, have uh, Zipper or Secret Network and above so that we can maximize our spend, our TOA in our infrastructure without uh, having to spend multiple, multiple times over and over again. At the same time, uh, finding a modern architecture that could enable our warfighters to be that much more agile uh, in keeping with 3-1 uh, principles. Um, and so going down the list, um, we have a number calling in from area code 317. Could you identify yourself and maybe introduce yourself? Yes, my name's David Blair, Pack App. Okay. Basically here on. Go ahead. It, uh, basically here on a uh, um, learning venture. Perfect. Awesome. And uh, I suspect that would uh, be the case for a number of folks. And we have an area code four zero eight in Silicon Valley. Well, nothing heard. Uh, Bunny, you're next. Hi, everyone. My name is Bunny Hernandez. Um, I am here with Cameron Bonoski. Uh, we um, co-own and work uh, for Shebash, our company, uh, but more specifically, we're working with Platform One right now. Um, so I'm here to learn more about the technology and really get into um, the details as best as I can understand them so that I can better understand how to facilitate and support the R&D efforts that um, Sticks mentioned, for example, um, and see if there aren't any opportunities where essentially a, a you know a virtuous value cycle could be uh, created across the organizations. Oh, thank you, Bunny. Cameron? Hey, thank you, Sticks. Um, to just tag on to what Bunny had mentioned, um, you know, we have a company that's contracting to Platform One right now. I specifically support the CNAP team, the Cloud Native Access Point, and where my interest in uh, this technology really is, um, is in places where we have gaps, uh, how we can implement um, SVR and uh, the, like, the router itself as, you know, to strengthen our zero trust posture, um, which goes into some R&D work, but that's it, over. Awesome, thanks, Cameron. Uh, Boris. I think Boris you have might. to unmute. All right, it's all right. Uh, we'll skip Boris. Nothing hurt, Boris. <laughs> hey, can you guys can you guys hear me? Oh, now we can. Yeah, go for it. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, my name is Boris Kalimnik. I'm the uh, federal sales director uh, with Juniper for the uh, session smart routing portfolio uh, that we're going to talk about today. And uh, essentially my role is I support the entire uh, federal team and work with federal customers across uh, uh, you know, the entire organization on sessions for routing. So I'm 
looking forward to this. I appreciate everyone joining. All right. Sounds good. Thanks, Boris. Uh, Jordan Thomas. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, Jordan Thomas from Johns Hopkins Applied Physics Lab, uh, supporting uh, Colonel Chu and the uh, Chief Architect's Office in the, in the IWM project. Thanks, uh, Jordan. Uh, uh, George Bacon or Jorge? Yeah, this is Jorge Pagan. Um, yeah, I'm just here uh, to learn, Colonel, uh, from good. PACAF crew. Awesome. Good to have the PACAF crew here. Uh, Philip? Uh, yeah, Phil Bianco from Carnegie Mellon, a software engineer institute. Uh, I'm here to learn more about the technology so that I can help uh, better document the architecture and the analysis of alternatives. Thanks, Phil. Uh, I'll skip Rob and uh, go to Ryan Raber. Hey, uh, Ryan Raber from PACF A65 on the ops integrator for PACF. So uh, looking again to understand the technology. Sweet. Um, <clears throat> Ted. Hey everybody, Ted Josue from Booz Allen Hamilton. Um, I, I support the Colonel Chu in the Chief Architect Office. Um, really, this is fascinating to me. So uh, I've been wanting to do deep dives. So I'm really glad you set this up. It should be really great and interesting. So thank you. Awesome. And uh, finally, um, C. Colt from uh, PACAF. Not hearing you if you were speaking. I see, I see you unmuted. All right, nothing heard. So, um, hey, Rob, uh, over to you. Sounds like somebody was trying to trying to speak. Oh, oh, yeah, we just had a couple of people uh, sign in um, from area code seven one nine. Hi, this is Camille Colt with PACAF. Pac I'm struggling with uh, the audio on Zoom today. So I uh, just part of the crew, support the, the solutions architect, work under Sean Harbert. Nice. Okay, awesome. So, okay, I see uh, uh, 719 and, uh, and also the Zoom call as well. And I think we have somebody else. Uh, we, go ahead. We just had uh, Adam Harden, who is one of the, the senior network engineers for PACAF, jump on as well. We got Perfect. foiled by the, the changed meeting. So I apologize for us being late. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, my, my mistake. Um, I, uh, I uh, used a Zoom in order to be more inclusive here. But uh, <clears throat> all right. Hey, uh, Rob, uh, over to you. Okay, awesome. Um, so for the folks on the phone, has anyone uh, seen any of like the, the demo videos or any of the content that we've created for the federal customers um, before? Or is everyone coming into this uh, a little bit cold? I'm coming into a cold. Okay. All right. I'm going to make that assumption of everyone else. Um, so back uh, late last year, Juniper acquired a company called 128 Technology. They had been around for about uh, six or six plus years. The, the genesis of that company came out of a, uh, another company called Acme Packet. They built the first session border controllers, um, which are deployed all over uh, you know, the DOD to help integrate voice networks to you know uh, do voice firewalls that sort of stuff and so what that company uh, 128 or uh, 128 technology uh, came from the founders of acme packet and what 128 built was a new type of router so um, what they uh, the the fundamental nature of the the session smart router which is the technology that um, juniper acquired um, is basically a router that doesn't operate at layer three, it operates at layer four, it doesn't route packets, it routes sessions, um, and it's completely stateful versus stateless. So um, it's, a, it's a pretty big difference in terms of what's happening underneath the hood. So you have a router that's operating higher up in the OSI model that gives you a lot more flexibility and capability that you would uh, get out of a normal, uh, you know, kind of dumb layer three router. And so the outcome of that basically is a whole bunch of different technical things, but the, the way that I try to convey it is this idea of being able to build a mission first network. So can you create a network that um, understands the context of the traffic that it's actually transporting um, in a way that goes well beyond trying to do things just like DPI, for example, one that creates a completely stateful network. 
And so the, the big capability um, that that gives you is the ability to translate intent into configuration and outcome very, very easily. Um, and uh, everyone can see my screen and hear me uh, well. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yes. So, um, you know, when it comes to intent, basically, you know, when we look at this from a, a DoD perspective, there's going to be some set of mission requirements that you're going to have, and those are going to be usually a who, what, and how. So I want these people to be able to access this thing, and when they do, here's how I want the network to behave. And so today, um, the existing technologies that are in these large-scale networks are, you know, using this legacy data model that's completely stateless that operates at layer three. All the network elements that are there are processing packets. They're not processing the context of a session end to end. And so they're operating at the packet layer, whereas the requirements are really at the session layer and we operate at the session layer. And so some of the, the key characteristics of the technology um, is that we can essentially close the gap, right? So we create a session aware fabric and uh, we use a session aware data model that lets us close the gap between the requirements um, and the actual implementation of the configuration uh, in the network. And so some of the key characteristics that we have are we create a very simple network. So we're completely tunnel free. So we don't use any encapsulation uh, based mechanisms for uh, you know, traditional IPsec GRE to do what we do. Um, so when it comes to SD-WAN, we're the only tunnel free SD-WAN solution that's in the market. Um, and then the data model is one that is very mission centric. So it creates simplicity and just understanding how things are configured and how to make modifications to network behavior. And then we're completely software based. So there's no hardware requirement. We're hardware agnostic. That lets you deploy us on anything, anywhere. And the only requirement from a networking standpoint is IP reachability between the routers. Um, so, and it's, we're flexible enough there. If you had an existing CentOS or Red Hat, uh, you know, instance, and you wanted to install our software on top of it, you can absolutely do that. Uh, from a resiliency standpoint, we have true separation of management control and data planes. So as part of the technology that Juniper acquired, um, you know, we have the, the session smart router, but we also have a routing protocol that we developed as well that we're uh, going to be opening up as an RFC near the end of the year. And so what that does is it runs in band into the network, which means there's no reliance on the orchestration layer to function. And so that allows us to operate in environments where we have uh, denied connectivity or very degraded or limited amounts of bandwidth. Um, so essentially the network will continually function regardless of whether or not the, uh, the orchestration layer is able to be contacted. And then since we don't use any tunnels, there's no overhead of tunnel-based encapsulation. So you're saving anywhere between you know, 15 to 50% of your bandwidth based upon packet size. So where you do have a situation where you have very limited communications, um, you want to make sure every bit counts and we're able to do that. And then since we don't rely on the orchestration layer to do what we do, um, everything happens in band with the SVR routing protocol. And it's a, actually a unique routing protocol. It's not just a, you know, in essence, a fork of BGP, which some other vendors have approached. Um, you know, the, the network is completely self-driving uh, and the router is able to make decisions about what they need to do on their own. On the security side, everything is completely air-gapped. Um, so nothing ever has to talk to the internet. And then the licensing is uh, trust-based. So essentially, you know, um, there's no uh, hard requirement to you know, contact a licensing server that's external to the network. It just, you know, will operate essentially. Um, it's all based upon, you know, the, the, us trusting that the customer would abide by the terms of license agreement. And so that also means that there's no um, capping of what the routers are capable of doing. So if you deployed a router for hundred megabits and you suddenly needed to do a gigabit and you had the hardware that would allow you to do it, it'll just do it. Um, there's also no time bombing of the license. So essentially it'll run indefinitely. And then from an end to end perspective, there's visibility. Um, so if, uh, if we get into you know doing an actual packet walk, I can show you exactly how this uh, actually occurs, but basically, we're able to see the context of each session uniquely as it traverses the entire network. Um, and we're also tracking the uh, behavior of that all the way down to things like TLS handshake timings, TCP handshake retransmission rates, all that sort of stuff uh, is being tracked across every single hop within the network in a global context. And then um, we do end-to-end -end FIPS encryption and authentication for every single session. And then we enforce you know, micro-segmentation, zero trust, essentially uh, out of the box by default, since we function as a stateful firewall. So I'll pause here for a second and see if there's any questions. Hey, this is uh, Adam Harden with the uh, A36. So 
Um, quick question, the sprouting protocol that you're talking about, and then also the tunnelless, uh, you know, infrastructure, tunnelless uh, capabilities, is that only for, you know, if you, you know, if you own all the IP address space, that would be for these private, you know, networks uh, where you got secret class or top secret class, you know, where you have all the IP address space from point to point and you don't need to do any tunneling or, or is that just how it works all the time? And, and I'd like to understand that a little bit better. Yeah, that's, that's, that's how it works by default. Um, so you can run our routing protocol. So let's say you wanted to spin up a thousand sites and you wanted to use just, um, you know, uh, public internet for connectivity, right? We can do, uh, we can do that um, without the use of any, any tunnel-based encapsulation. So without the use of IPsec uh, or, or, or GRE or VXLAN, things like that. Does, that. does that answer your question? Well, I mean, I, I'm still failing to, to understand how you would do it without, uh, well, uh, I guess, I mean, I guess the, the device would be sourcing, you know, the, the traffic altogether. And yeah, it, yeah. It, it, so, it, so your routing protocol then put it back together on the, the exactly. far end on the destination. Okay, so yeah. So you send some kind of information that identifies what network it belongs to. I, I mean, that's cool. That's cool. That's thinking outside the box for sure. Yeah, it, when when I get to a packet walk, once we kind of go through the data model, the, the packet walk would be relevant to go through because, um, you know, when I start call, you know talking about things like tenants and services, it'll make more sense. Um, but a, a packet walk, I think, will directly answer uh, how we're able to maintain context without the use of tunnels, um, which is right. traditionally been a really difficult thing to do, if not impossible, because to do it, you have to build a brand new well, yeah, I mean, it's not impossible. It's just that, you know, a long time ago, you know, that was the way they thought about it at the time was to, you know, create an extra uh, header, you know, on at, at layer three to add on an extra set of IP addresses, right? And then a marking that it was a tunnel type scenario. But like, you don't really have to do that. I mean, every time the, the packet hits a different box, I mean, it's, it's pretty much generating the packet brand new to, you know, switch it through from one side or route it through from one side to another anyway. So if you guys determine a better way to do it besides tunneling, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, all you'd have to do is have, have the destination have some sort of routing information that, you know, that, and then have a, a code of what it meant so that when you're doing the rebuild on the other side, you can replace the private IP on the inside with, you know, what it was, you know, from originally from the source, right? Yep. The, you yeah. have to have some sort of translation mechanism to be able to, to build that table. Yep. You, you, you were describing yeah. a lot of, a lot of what we're doing. Yeah, let's um, let's uh, yeah, Rob, keep going on yeah. this, and uh, it's clear to me that Adam's going to have a lot of questions. So keep thinking of these questions, Adam. We'd love uh, to hear them uh, once we get a little further down. So, as an example of kind of using the technology, basically, you know, it, it, you may have a scenario like this where we have some mission planners and they want to deploy or modify an application and they want to change how the network's going to behave, right? So they may suddenly want to change the priority that that application has to make it more important than everything else that's running on the network to change how it's going to route along with what paths it's going to take within the network to meet things like different SLAs, um, even, you know, continually attempt to hit those SLAs even as the network is changing. And then also to modify zero trust. So to change how specific users and devices are allowed to access that specific application, either expanding the uh, number of users and devices or contracting it. And to do all that essentially in real time versus weeks to months. And so that's what we're able to do. And the network that we would create or the network you may see in this scenario may look something like this, where we have our application that exists someplace that could be out in you know, private cloud, your own, your own data center. We have the users that exist someplace, they could be mobile, they could be in a physical location, and there's a network in between. 
And so in part, that might be, say, the Doden. There might be other services that exist. There might be meet me points you're going through. You might use MPLS as the primary means of connectivity. That might also get you into the AFNET. There might be 5G. There might be Starlink, MILSAT connectivity. And so there's obviously existing routing infrastructure that's in these networks. And so what we do is place SSR routers at key strategic locations, both out at the edge, as well as where the applications live and in key places in between to do the session-based routing that we do. And so those routers are managed by our conductor. This is what puts policy onto the routers and tells the routers, here's how you should behave. And then at that point, the routers are left to do what they need to go and do. And so what that means is they're gonna be forming uh, peering adjacencies between each other over the different types of transport. And you know that's gonna happen across any type of IP network where they need to. They also speak all the legacy routing protocols around BGP, OSPF. So integration into you know, existing networks is seamless. And then where we don't need to do direct routing integration, we'll simply leverage those networks as transport. And what we wind up creating is this session where networking fabric, and you can think of it sort of like a distributed staple firewall. And so those mission planners can go to our conductor and then modify how that entire fabric is gonna behave in literally two clicks. Um, and so what will happen once that the, the behavior modification has been put in place by changing policy is a different set of decisions are gonna be made about how sessions are gonna be treated as they enter the fabric. And so when I talk about a session, what I'm referring to is like a TCP UDP session. So we're talking about source desk protocol, source desk ports. So that unique relationship um, and what's what that session is gonna be entering is this service aware networking fabric. And so between the routers, we're running the secure vector routing, routing protocol. Um, and so what that's doing is it's figuring out where certain uh, you know, uh, users exist, where applications and services exist, the types of connectivity, and then what is the right way to route different types of traffic based upon policy. And so when a user creates a session, so for example, you know, signing into Zoom or, or signing into Teams, that session is then gonna enter an SSR. And since we're fully stateful, we're gonna detect a new session has arrived. We will then ask three separate questions about that session. So who is the source? What is the intended destination? Does the who have access to the what? Because it has to be allowed by policy, otherwise it's denied. And if it is, how should that session then be delivered? And so what is associated with that specific session are policies that govern how it will be routed and secured. And so if those uh, you know, policies said, all right, I want you to take a certain amount of uh, latency in, in, in the path from, from a routing standpoint, we'll leverage secure vector routing to figure out, well, what's the right set of, uh, of paths to take? as well as to transport that specific session across the network. And then we'll deliver that session hop by hop till we reach the last SSR in the chain of custody. And then we'll deliver the session to the destination, either preserving the original source and destination IP addresses and ports, or we can NAT and low balance the traffic to the destination. And so a little bit more about that who, what, and how. So let's say a general patent needs to access C2ISR. The who is general patent, this is our source or client. The what is C2ISR, a destination or server. And so he'd be creating sessions from his laptop or his phone, and then we would associate policy with each one of those sessions. And then given the context that it's C2ISR and general patent is the consumer, how should those sessions then be delivered? So across what networks should they traverse? What paths within those networks? What encryption should be applied? And what priority should those sessions receive? So that SSR is asking, who is it? What are they trying to access? If it is allowed, how should I do that? Another way to think of it is if you've seen kindergarten. Now we're going to do something extremely fun. We're going to play a wonderful game called Who is my daddy and what does he do? And so essentially we replace Arnold and you can think of all those kids as sessions. And so this is basically, you know, this concept of, of who, what, and how is, is key to our data model. And so the who in our data model is referred to as a tenant. And so tenancy is um, determined based upon how the traffic ingressed into the fabric, just looking at the source. So things like the source IP address or sub that the interface you ingressed into the fabric on or the VLAN that you ingressed into the fabric on. And you can use those things in combination. You can think of this like an ingress VRF or a community of interest. The what in our data model is referred to as a service. This is also somewhat like an application definition. And so the service contains details about how that service is defined. So what you're going to, so things like the destination IP addresses or subnets, the ports and protocols in use, DNS, DPI, TLS information. And then the service is gonna contain within it an access policy that defines who, so which specific tenants can access it. And then the service is also gonna to link to specific policies that define the how. 
And so if a tenant is allowed to access a service, then the how is determined for each session and over the life of those sessions. And the how is two components. There's a security policy and a service policy. The security policy controls how we apply encryption. And then the service policy governs the routing decisions that we make across the fabric for the session. Any questions on this so far? Because we have a tenant that's gonna attempt to access a service. That access is governed by the access policy. And then the security and service policies are applied uh, if access is allowed. And Robert, I have a quick question. This is Phil. Um, you know, I, I like this and I understand the need for these policies. I guess just what have you thought out, like how you protect people from themselves, how, you know, you would stop me from doing something that might affect somebody um, else and or them, you know, making changes to something right before I go on a mission. How, how, is, how is that validated or controlled? Like, how do you make that usable? Yeah, so. Um... You know, it's it's really going to come down to how you want to run change control, right? So, um, if you wanted to use something like ServiceNow or another ITSM tool to look at um, policy, uh, you know, there's some integration that's really really easy to do to to govern things from those those type of platforms, so that people are not making direct changes on uh, you know on the system itself. Um, and then for you know doing uh, network analysis. Um, the, the big thing there would be to, um, you know, collect data from the current network environment and just make sure that, you know, the, the configuration that you're about to apply is going to be valid. Um, and so part of the, part of the thing that, that, uh, you know, would need to be looked at in the future is basically how modeling simulation, uh, would be applied for things like SVR and, and some of the other, uh, uh, other routing protocols that would be involved in a network, you know, that's operating at scale. Okay, so you will provide like some kind of at least rudimentary impact analysis, so I can see what's kind of going on, if if I if I were the one making this these changes. Yeah, and and so the 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 changes could be made in a a pretty isolated manner, and then there also you also could make changes all the way down to how you would uh, want to impact routing for an individual user. So if you wanted to. Um, you know, make a policy change that was not global in nature, but isolated a very specific thing. Uh, you can be very granular about how those decisions are made. Okay, thanks. So a bit about the security and service policies. Um, so the, the security policy is really about how uh, encryption should be applied. So this is done per service. And so essentially there's three options. There's don't add encryption, always add encryption, or detect whether or not the traffic is already encrypted and then opt to not encrypt it again, uh, or if the traffic is unencrypted to encrypt it. So that's what we call adaptive encryption. So this just lets us lower the amount of overhead that we apply to a session um, in the event that we you know, don't have to encrypt it again. And then the service policy is how do I transport that session? So what network types, what SLAs may we want to apply, what QoS settings might we want to uh, enforce, uh, how we may want to ensure resiliency for things like you know, packet duplication, um, how we wanted to do failover and reversion, uh, if we wanted to apply things like TCP optimization to the traffic, because uh, we can do that natively, um, and then how we may want to NAT and low balance the traffic. And so I think probably now is a good segue to do a quick demo. Um, I don't know, Peter, if you have an opinion on that or not. So I'm going to just run through the demo scenario real quick, since I think we have some of the, the key concepts down in terms of the data model. So for the, uh, from, the data, from the data model perspective, you know, I'm the uh, presenter, usually I'm doing this over Teams. Um, in this case, we're doing it over Zoom, the same kind of thing applies where essentially the edge router is gonna be looking at my traffic coming into it and it's gonna see the source tenant as being you know, um, you know, the, the edge user, right? And then the destination service is gonna be Teams or Zoom or whichever service it happens to be. And then in, from, from my perspective, you know, I have this edge router, that's my next hop. And so it has three different types of transport. So 4G, Starlink, and MPLS. And then it has two next hops that it could take. So um, both of those next hop routers have connectivity into the MPLS network. Core North also has connectivity into 4G and then also to Starlink. From there, there's an additional hop out to a data center router. So we're doing multi-hop routing without any tunnels. And then out to the internet and then to Teams or in this case, Zoom. And then obviously everyone's you know, watching this from the perspective of the viewer. 
And so the conductor is in the network. It's managing all the routers in terms of what configuration is applied to them. Um, and then there's a policy that's applied to the network that basically says prefer MPLS type of pads um, and then Starlink and then LTE, as long as they're up and available and able to hit an SLA of 75 milliseconds or better. And so in my current network, I've degraded the connectivity from edge one to core north. Um, and so as a result, all of my traffic is gonna flow through core south over to the data center and then out to the public internet. And then what I'll do is I'll degrade the path from core south over um, to edge one so that the traffic would then go to the next type of connectivity, which in this case would be Starlink. And so we're gonna seamlessly reroute from core south to core north, and there's no state information that is pre-exchange between core south and core north. Essentially core north has no idea what's about to happen. And then what I'll do is I'll remove the latency from the network, and then the sessions will then migrate back to the original intended transport. So any questions on, on the, the scenario that I'm about to show? All right, let me see if I can pull up some. All right, so I got some video, I have some pings. And uh, on the pings on the one going out to Google, this is just going out to Google. On the one that's going right here, this is essentially going to the data center um, side of my network. And it is going, uh, it's at 1400 bytes and the path over Starlink is I believe 1350 bytes. So we're gonna be able to get the, uh, those pings across with the DF uh, bit set without having any dropped packets um, or any fragmentation that's noticeable to the end user. And so this is what our orchestration layer looks like. So this is our conductor. So I can see the different routers that are in the network. Um, I also can see how they're individually performing. So the types of traffic, um, the sessions that are currently going through the actual network. And then I can also see, um, for example, the performance. So if I were to look here, I can see I have different paths with different, with different amounts of latency that are going through the network. Um, and so my path to core north is essentially violating my SLA because it's at 110 milliseconds and my path to core south is not. And if we look at our traffic, all my uh, traffic is still going over the MPLS path. Let me just set this to the last five minutes. So still going over MPLS and it's all going over core south, essentially the way that the traffic should be traversed in the network. And so um, I can also see each individual session so if we look, we have these global unique session identifiers that are assigned to each session, and that's what's tracking state for each session as it goes through the entire network. And if we look at core north, what we can see is there's essentially no, uh, no traffic versus what we can see on core south. So lots of sessions on core south because that's how all my traffic is traversing the network. And so what I'll do is I'm gonna add some latency in the network. So I'm just gonna inject 100 milliseconds of latency. And so we should see both of these guys bump up to 100 milliseconds and we do. And so what's happening from the router's perspective is they're figuring out what is the underlying state of the network and is it able to meet an SLA or not? And if it's not, what is the right next routing decision to make? And so what we'll see in a second is essentially the latency will drop back down because our sessions are gonna migrate from core south over to core north, which has just happened. So we can see latencies drop, drop down to 45 milliseconds um, and then 36 milliseconds. And so if we look at our sessions, so if we look at say core north, we can see uh, sessions are bumping up, the bandwidth is bumping up. And on the edge, edge side, still the same, same traffic behavior. And if we look at our latency statistics, I can see when I added the latency into the network, and then my traffic is uh, essentially rerouted from using MPLS over to using Starlink. And if I remove the latency from the network, I'll see the network can uh, essentially migrate those sessions back to the original intended transport. So any questions on this short little demo that I just went through? Uh, hi, uh, Robert, this is Mario. I, I do have a quick question, uh, perhaps related to, to the demo in general. Um, what are the what's the performance hit uh, for using this solution versus a uh, a typical layer three uh, type solution? Because I imagine that uh, uh, you know the, the routers have to keep track of the sessions, and that probably creates some performance uh, degradation, if you will, compared to the typical layer three. Uh, I don't know if you could 
you could talk a little bit about that and then um, perhaps, uh, you know, if, if there is anything that this solution may impose on the applications uh, using it. So in other words, is there, is there any impact uh, whatsoever on, on the applications exchanging the data now that they, there's this session-based uh, routing, so to speak, do, do the applications need to know something extra that they didn't know before? Yep. So the from the application perspective, uh, it has no idea this is going on, right? So Zoom, Teams, none of the applications know this is occurring. They just have the ability to connect um, and maintain the connectivity. And then from a uh, an overhead perspective, um, the way that we function is similar to a stateful firewall. So essentially, there is session establishment that occurs, um, and then at that point when we actually are doing routing. Um, basically, uh, in, in, when, I, when I go through and, and do a packet walk, it looks like a full NAT underneath the hood. So um, it's extremely fast uh, from a performance standpoint on just you know, a single socket x86 system with high core count, we can you know, hit almost 200 gigabits per second. Um, so from a throughput and performance standpoint, it uh, works very, very well. Um, and then from a network standpoint, if we look at the comparison of bandwidth, um, you know, I'm looking at just the last five minutes Right. Um, if I were to be using a traditional, you know, layer three router approach to do SD WAN, that may require, you know, using things like VX LAN and stuff like that to be able to maintain context across the entire network. So the way that we're able to um, route sessions doesn't use any of this uh, encapsulation layer, which in the last, you know, five minutes would have saved 20% of the bandwidth. Um, so this isn't, you know, WAN up where you're saving payload based upon byte level dedupe. We're just saving it based upon packet size and the pure math of, re of removing the headers. Okay, uh, thank you. And then uh, I do have one more question, uh, sorry. Uh, in terms of uh, session identification, is that purely based on IP and port? Is that, you know, is there some sort of like mapping that needs to happen ahead of time uh, when somebody's designing the networks and designing what the policies ought to be? Uh, you know, is, do they have to know I'm going to have these type of applications connected on these IPs, and they're going to be connected on these ports, and and you know they'll be communicating to these other applications over on these IPs on these ports. And does that have to happen ahead of time? And because uh, I'm thinking in terms of like the uh, reorganization of the networks, if if one of those devices say was to be taken offline for whatever reason, the graded mode, uh, you know, as a, as a designer. Do I need to anticipate all of those things ahead of time, or, or how does it work typically? Yeah, so so we do have DPI-based mechanisms. There's different ways to run the configuration um, to kind of simplify stuff. I can kind of show what the you know how we would do that with ServiceNow, for example. So there's DPI um, and other mechanisms that we can use to figure out you know what specific things are there in the network. Um, but you know it very functions much like a you know staple firewall because that's what we are. Um, so you know. If you don't allow certain types of traffic, they're not going to be allowed. So you could have very permissive rules um, and then just narrow, narrow down and be more granular with what is allowed. Uh, or you could you know, uh, basically start with a, a blacklist of like everything's denied and, and we're just going to be slowly allowing things to, um, to occur. So it, it's, it's really going to depend upon you know, uh, what's the easiest way for you to implement um, you know, the, the, the network routing. Um, from an access standpoint. Does that make sense? Yes, it, it does. I'm just trying to figure out kind of like what's the, the you know, how hard would it be to set up something like that uh, in, in something like the Air Force you know, being such a large uh, organization? That's, that's yeah, it, yeah. So, so the, the you know, that's that's part of the, the, the thing that we've been, you know, working to, to address um, specifically with, you know, how we create, you know, the uh, services, for example. Right. So I'll just kind of show you, I'll skip ahead a little bit to the service now slides to, you know, if you had an inventory of the things that were running in the network, you may put it in some sort of ITSM platform. Maybe it's service now, maybe it's remedy, maybe it's something else, but basically it should have, okay, we have an application called C2ISR. It's owned by someone. It lives someplace physically in the world. It's running on some set of servers, right. That are someplace. And so what we do is, you know, Obviously, you're using these type of tools to run change control, to set priority, how you respond to if, if there's an outage, to do change controls, this sort of stuff. So we can embed a little bit of our configuration into a system like uh, ServiceNow to basically say, do I want to create the same thing within the orchestration layer? And if I do, what policies may I want to apply? 
And so in here, basically I can say, all right, well, I'm gonna create the same thing. So I'm gonna take the service that's defining service now and define it in our orchestration layer. And then I'm going to take the details that are in that ITSM tool and populate our definition of that service. So I'm gonna take the, you know, the addresses and ports and protocols that are used by those servers and populate it into our definition. Same thing with who's allowed to access the application. In addition for how we want to define what security and service policies we would apply, right? So, um, you know, if there is some system of record that contains what this stuff is, right, then we can leverage that as a means to say, okay, well, here's the definitions that we need to be aware of. And more importantly, if we go back here and someone changes the servers that, you know, are running the application or they add, you know, new, new ports and protocols that are in use, we can translate that from that system of record into the network configuration without having this, you know, gap that gets created because of, you know, application changes that application owners make. Makes sense. Thank you. So, hey, Robert, I have more of a, a general question for you when you're running the demo. So you're showing us environments that look like they're fairly stable with, you know, lots of alternative paths. How does this look when we're doing something like Diego Garcia or these limited bandwidth, uh, really, really challenged environments? Yeah. So in in those cases, um, you know, the the decisions that you're left with are basically do um, you know you allow certain types of traffic to traverse these alternate tertiary paths, um, or in the event where you have only one type of connectivity. You know what you know, and that connectivity degrades. How do you make a decision about what is the most relevant thing to be sending across the network, right? So um, the way in which we detect the characteristics of the path um, basically can be used to say, all right, you know, I have a very limited satellite connection. I think I have some slides that depict that type of scenario. Let's see if they're in here. Yep, they are. So for example, the normal way that you do QoS is all based around, do you have congestion on an interface based upon that interface's known capacity? So, you know, you have different types of traffic and I can make QoS decisions based upon the state of those interfaces. But if the thing in the middle breaks and I have lots and lots of edges and I have all sorts of different things that are going on, what happens if that network degrades, right? So in this scenario, I have, you know, just one type of transport um, I have no control over that transport and I have no alternates. And so in this specific case, you know, the way that this type of uh, connectivity may exhibit itself is things like increases in packet loss, jitter or latency. Um, and that could be because of load or stability or you wind up having jamming issues or stuff literally is taken physically offline. Um, and so there's only a certain number of things that you can do. One of them is you can detect that this is occurring and then you can make decisions about what to do. And you know, in, in our case, to reduce the volume or rate of traffic that is non-critical. And so in, in our case, this would be detecting that, okay, the, the, the satellite connection has degraded and I have things that are critical and things that are non-critical. And I'm gonna make a decision to um, either slow down dramatically or maybe even just stop um, non-mission activity. So uh, basically I'm gonna use, you know, dedicate the bandwidth that is available to the most critical thing that I have and then wait until that network has then uh, kind of reverted to normal operating state and then allow that non-critical act, uh, activity to resume. So this is, I, I don't know, hopefully that, that kind of addressed a little bit of your question. It helps, thank you. And that's all based around uh, SLA enforcement. So looking at, you know, uh, under what conditions certain types of traffic should be allowed. Hey, real quick, um, just to follow on to the same one. Is this something you're going to have to do in real time, or can you set up options in advance of expecting a problem like that? You can set it all up in advance. Awesome. Thank you. And so those policies can be put in place. And then if the orchestration layer is disconnected, the router is going to make its decisions without any connectivity to the orchestration layer. There's a pre recorded version of the demo that I just did where I turn off the orchestrator and I then reboot the edge router uh, with the orchestration layer turned off. And this same exact thing occurs in terms of what you saw. And then that also means that, you know, you can locally configure the routers. So if I go over to, um, this is basically, if, if I had only, so this is the orchestrator and I have a bunch of routers. If I log in locally just to the router, I can see just that router. I still have all of the same um, reporting capabilities. That's, those all exist locally. So if I was completely isolated, 
and I needed to make configuration changes locally on the router, I still have the ability to do that. It's still there. Uh, so all the same UI, all the same reporting, all the same APIs um, exist locally on each, each device. And so, um, you know, one of the one of the things that that, that Peter pointed me to was uh, JP three twelve. Um, and so, you know, I, I read through that and and kind of looked at some of the things that were in there and, and tried to apply, you know, um, some of the thinking that's in that in that document to you know things that we can do with the SSR. So, if we wanted to deny threat action, right, I can redirect or revector threat traffic that's based upon what service policy I'm applying to things. Um, if I wanted to block threat traffic that's just changing an access policy. If I wanted to slow threat traffic down, that's changing a service policy to change how we're going to enforce QoS. Um, alternately, if I wanted to peel users off and send them to a honeypot version of an application, that's essentially just changing something's tenancy um, to then send it someplace else. So instead of the original application, it's a different version of it. If we wanted to ensure the freedom of maneuver, that might be to enhance the priority mission traffic, which kind of goes to the outline of the first scenario I was going through. Or I may want to maneuver and reroute. I may want to avoid compromised network terrain, things like that. Um, I may want to establish new points of presence on demand. And so this is what we've been doing this last one um, in uh, on ramp four, as well as guide three. Um, and so here we're using commercial comms to transport nipper and zipper traffic. And one of the things that comes up is, you know, what happens if someone winds up hijacking your traffic, right? So they, you know, have some BGP hijacking that occurs. And so we're collecting a lot of data on how the network is behaving between the routers. So let's say our scenario was we had a router out in the Philippines and it's connecting back over undersea fiber optic cable into the US. So we have a stopover in Japan and then we keep on going. And if our friends, the Ministry of State Security get involved and they wind up hijacking our traffic, that's going to exhibit some sort of network uh, behavioral change. So there's a variety of different ways you can detect it. Um, from our perspective, you know, we're collecting data between the routers, so latency loss, jitter, packet loss, MTU, all that sort of stuff. And so what we may wind up seeing is a degradation in latency. So the underlying baseline latency increases. And so that data can be exported to an ML system. And then a very simple ML policy to say, if you see this much change, deviation in this duration, and it continues for this time, that's going to be a condition that we want to react to. And that reaction may mean spinning up another SSR at another point of presence and that automatically changing how routing is done through the network. So in the event that something happens, basically we can automatically deal with it. And then if we're leveraging some of the undersea fiber optic carriers, or you know, some, of the, some of the main network providers like AWS, Azure, Equinix, um, as the, the transport, um, we can then leverage their undersea fiber optic backbone to get traffic back where it needs to go. And so this multi-hop routing architecture is what we put in place in uh, on-ramp uh, four and guide three. And so this is what we call session smart routing for classified. It's basically the application of session smart routing to the classified space. And so um, in both those events, we had an edge site that had Starlink and 4G. We then had a teleport or data center side site that got us back into the rest of Nipper and Sipper. And so the, the thing here was how do you get that end-to-end -end connectivity? So the edge site was behind a carry grade NAT and um, you know, uh, the teleport site had outbound only connectivity. So we leverage what we call a relay router um, that exists out in the cloud, in this case, AWS GovCloud. And so both of those routers connect to separate elastic uh, IP addresses on separate interfaces on that relay router. And that helps negate um, our issues around carrier grade NAT. It also uh, limits the metadata footprint that we leave on the network because the edge never communicates directly back to the teleport. And then we put our type one encryptors with our separate enclaves uh, behind that encrypted black network. And they establish their security adjacencies, giving us the end-to-end -end communication for Nipper and Sipper. And so we're doing this with no additional overhead, saving upwards of 200 bytes a packet. Uh, if we looked at IMAX packet sizes, you know, we're saving over half the bandwidth. That really router can exist anywhere for any duration of time. Um, and then it's also gonna minimize the metadata footprint that you leave because essentially you see an edge site connecting to some random elastic IP address. And then if you wanted to, you could use that relay router for a day and burn it down, never use it again. And then that brings us to, you know, how do we control the behavior of traffic as, uh, you know, we have different types of things going on behind these uh, type one encryptors. And so there basically we have this tenant and service model. So if I had mission activity and non-mission activity, that's going to enter this red router, and we're going to look at it from the tenant and service uh, aspect. So who is the source? What's the intended destination? Is it allowed to happen? And then if it is, how do we then uh, you know, allow that traffic to behave, or how should it behave? 
And so in part, that may mean when it comes to QoS, marking that traffic. And then what the SSR uh, has is the ability to determine, all right, if stuff is marked six versus eight for a single IPsec session, what should I do with that traffic? So I may want to send the stuff that's marked six one way, the stuff that's marked eight another. And then we're able to do that while maintaining the context while stripping the markings before it's sent and using different encryption keys per path. Um, so you know we're, we're helping to obscure the traffic even further. And then when the traffic arrives at the other side, uh, we're able to understand the context of it and then deliver it on to its end destination. So any questions on any of this? And then the other piece um, when it comes to ensuring freedom of maneuver is the ability to enhance the priority emission traffic. And so, um, you know, in this case, you know, how do you give something more bandwidth or lower latency, for example? So if I look at that first scenario, basically in here was I want to change the priority. I want to change how routing is done and I don't want to change zero trust. And if we look at this, there's a who that's in here. So instead of authorized users and devices, there's a what. So an application and then there's a how, essentially, you know, how I want the network to behave. And so um, when we create a service, right, I'm going to define in there who's allowed to access it. I'm going to define the service itself, the what, and then I'm going to assign the policies that dictate the how. And so if I wanted to change the end-to-end -end routing characteristics, it's as simple as saying, well, I have a, you know, a gold service policy. Maybe I want flash override. And so you would define these policies however makes sense uh, in terms of, you know, how you want the network to behave. And so essentially a two-click operation of selecting flash override and then hitting commit is going to change everything about how QoS is enforced for those sessions. So what class they're a part of, group application session level controls, we can control exactly how much bandwidth each individual session is able to consume, how marking and remarking is applied, the vectors are labeled paths that we take. So in the demo, one vector was MPLS, the other vector was Starlink, the other was LTE. So the order in which we were going to consume those networks, how we determine if the networks are able to meet SLAs, as well as how we do failover, um, and then how we fail back in the event that those networks stabilize. And so the end result is we have this you know, session where networking fabric that our mission planners can go to the conductor and modify how it, that whole fabric is going to behave in two clicks. And so when sessions then enter the network, we're able to then look at a different set of who, what, and how, specifically the how to dictate what, you know, how we want to do routing. So that may negate different paths within the network that are unable to meet my SLA. So my traffic is then going to be routed across whichever paths make the most sense based upon the policy. And then in the event the network degrades further, we're able to then detect that and seamlessly reroute. Uh, so this looks similar to what you might see from, say, uh, you know, segment routing, for example, but without any of the overhead or the complexity. And so we don't have to have SSRs everywhere. It's an additive process. Um, basically, you need at least two to run SVR. And for some of the stuff we're working on with CNAP um, out in Hanscom, we actually just have an SSR that's uh, doing routing. I can get into what that architecture looks like. Um, but basically, you know, we add routers, then the result is that we get more granularity, visibility about what's happening in the network. And the result is that we have a completely tunnel-free network. So uh, that's going to improve the amount of, uh, you know, uh, bandwidth that is available. It's going to improve user experience. The policy architecture is a who, what, and how. So it maps very well to, you know, changing mission requirements. Um, and, you know, it's simple enough that it lets you change how the network is going to behave globally, but to do so in a very granular fashion. You could make a global policy change that would only impact an individual user if you wanted to do that. From a resiliency standpoint, um, everything functions independent from orchestration. We'll push right through issues around MTUs, NATs, firewalls. So in the demo, I was rerouting packets um, that were essentially too big to fit down the path, and we were taking care of the fragmentation and reassembly on behalf of client and server without them being aware that it's occurring. And then when we do failover, it's all per session, not per tunnel. So it's uh, you know very granular. On the security side, we're zero trust by default. There's full visibility for each session. Uh, I can get into a packet walk and show you exactly how we deliver that. Uh, there's end-to-end -end encryption. We obscure all the traffic in flight. So if you were to, for example, look at packets going between these routers, what you would see are a set of sessions using source and destination IP addresses of those two routers and source and destination ephemeral ports. So you wouldn't see the original tunnel endpoints or the original source and desk information on the wire. And then all the data that we're collecting, uh, that's happening locally. So you can consider that we run like a distributed analytics platform on each router. And so that data can be centralized if you wanted to do so. 
Um, and then the result is you can export that to things like Splunk, Elastic, Security Sidecar. Um, and so if those tools use the data to detect some anomaly, let's say you know, for you know, user behavior around that C2ISR application, they could then make an API call to us to change the service policy around, say, for example, you know, how they want traffic to route. So I could very easily just change the routing to push traffic through a more secure area of the network. And then the routing protocol that does all this under, under the hood is the secure vector routing protocol. This is something that there's a letter of intent as well as a draft RFC that we're working on to release um, near the end of the year. So I'll pause here and see if there's any questions um, or what other technical stuff you guys might like to go through. I do, I have a quick, a quick question. Uh, how, how does the uh, policies get uh, disseminated across the, the different routers? So I imagine once you make a, once, once somebody wants to make a policy change, uh, that has to be communicated across all the different routers in the network for to a subset, I imagine, or, or some, some number of them. How does that, how does that happen? Yeah, so, so that's done with reachability to the, the conductor. So basically we're relying on that to um, essentially host the policies that those routers then connect to the conductor to retrieve. Um, if you were to make local configurations, um, the, the way in which those configurations or the, the behavior change that you want to have happen to this session is conveyed in band um, via the, uh, what we call metadata. So I think it'd be worthwhile me doing a packet walk and it might be a little helpful in understanding what's happening underneath the hood. Let's see. And uh, Rob, just a point of cl cl clarification on the RFC release. I think the target date based on the commitment from the uh, executives is uh, 3 October to release the RFC. All right, so I'm going to go through. Um, yes, that, that, that's correct. Rob, Rob was on vacation when that commitment was made, so he might not be aware of the latest developments, but that's correct. Yeah, that, that's, that's uh, honestly news to me. So that's good to hear. Um, so I'll, I'll go through IPsec and then I'll go through SVR. So with IPsec, basically, you know, we have a user on the left, a server on the right. So the user creates a packet. That packet gets sent to the router. The router routes the packet. So it looks at the routing table and says, okay, for me to get you from router one to router two, you need to go into an IPsec tunnel. So that may mean I first wrap it in, say, GRE. I may then wrap that GRE inside of IPsec, and then I'll address it from router one to router two, and then send it on its merry way and hope Natraversal works. And then when we get to the other side, we de-encapsulate it and deliver the packet to the destination. Um, and then when the reverse happens, the reverse happens. And so basically, if you were to receive a packet with identical source destination IP addresses and ports, the way in which you would know the context is based upon you know, the, the, the tunnel encapsulation that that packet came from. So that's, that's really how everyone does it because to do it any other way requires that you have a stateful router. Um, and we're basically the only, you know, we're the only one that's out there. So if we look at the way we do secure vector routing, we have these concepts of tenant and service. So I have a tenant called JCS over on the left, a service called C2ISR on the right, and so what would happen here is the user would create some data. The data needs to go into a packet. The packet gets addressed the same way it did before and it gets sent to its default gateway, which in this case is the 128 router, the SSR. And so what happens is we first evaluate that packet based upon the session table. And so we're tracking every single session that's going through the network. And so when we see the packet, we're looking to see, is this packet part of a session that we are already tracking? And if it is not, we're then going to look at to see, all right, well, what was the source tenant? Okay, it's JCS. What was the destination? That matches C2ISR. Is JCS allowed to have access to C2ISR? If it is, we'll then look at the routing table to figure out what is the right next hop to take based upon the specifics of the policies applied for that session. Um, and so what will happen at this point is we'll then decide to route this traffic. And so we're going to assign this session a globally unique session identifier. This is going to persist across every single router that is going to route this session. We're associating with that session identifier the tenant, the service, the source and destination IP addresses and ports from that original packet. To route the traffic, we're then going to 
uh, create another entry in the session table with the same session identifier going from JCS to C2ISR. And now we're going to use waypoints to route this individual session. So we're going to use from waypoint one and a source ephemeral port to waypoint two and a destination ephemeral port. And these are the IP addresses that are owned by those routers. And so to convey the context, right? Because if I send a packet destined to port 46432, the router on the right has no idea what that's for. So the way we convey the context is with what we call metadata. And so this is going to contain all the original source destination IP address port information, the globally unique session identifier, the tenant service contacts, as well as the policies that are to be applied. And so from here, what we'll do is we'll take our metadata and our payload data. And since we have FIPS encryption enabled, we're going to encrypt both of those in the payload portion of the packet. And then we're going to NAT the packet from waypoint one to waypoint two. And then if we want to ensure delivery, I may add a DSCP marking. And so if anything happens to this packet, if it's NATed, if the DSCP marking is stripped or marked improperly, it doesn't matter as long as there's IP reachability. And so when the packet arrives at the destination, we will then pull out the encrypted payload. We will then pull out the metadata, and then we will write the contents of the metadata into our session table to track the session. And at this point, what we're then going to do is put our metadata off to the side since we don't need it anymore. And since we're tracking the session statefully, it only has to be sent on the first packet. We will then take our payload data, put it back where it needs to be, and then re the packet back to its original source and destination, as well as reapply our marking. And so in the, when the server responds, we're going to receive a packet that we're then going to be matching to a, uh, a packet in the session table. And then at that point, um, if we're you know, not doing encryption, essentially, it's just a full NAT in using DPDK to get it from one side to the other. If we are doing encryption, the encryption decryption process happens on ingress and egress to the fabric. So if there's middle routers in the middle that are routing this traffic, uh, basically, they're just NATing the traffic as it goes through. And then encryption decryption happens on ingress or egress. So I'll stop here and see if there's any questions on the packet walk. Can anyone still hear me? Yep. I, yep. Yeah, you're good. I guess everyone's just blown away. <laughs> Any other, other questions I might be able to answer? Is, is there only one conductor for the whole network, or can there be several? Um, so you can run multiple conductors. Um, so you can run them in HA. Um, there's also this concept of um, within the conductor, we create what we call an authority. That's what's used to manage all the routers and establish trust between the routers. Um, there is the concept of creating uh, inter-authority trust. So you can have multiple networks um, that are then exchanging routes between them, but they're managed independently. Thank you. I don't know, Peter, if there's anything that you wanted me to go through in more detail. Hey, Rob, can you talk about the packet duplication capability? I know that was an interest. Um... Yeah, yeah, I can actually go through um, what we did with uh, guide three. So I think we had the pack half CFK kit there. Yeah, that was actually demonstrated uh, with uh, Preston there asking Rob to unplug cables. Uh, without any scripts, and uh, uh, Rob had the look of terror on his face when he when he first asked that. Uh, it was quite funny to see, and glad that it worked. Well, it, 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 you suddenly changed my uh, what I was planning to demo. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, I, I walked through this whole scenario, right, of being able to use this relay router. Um, so, what we did in guide three was. Um, basically two separate scenarios. One of them was for um, a sipper. And so in this case, we had some black routers that got us back into the shock at Nellis. And so we created our connectivity from Alpina to um, a router out in AWS, then over to the black Juniper that was in shock. 
And then we had a, um, a KG that was providing us the, uh, the encrypted tunnel. And then behind that, we had our, our red routers. And so, you know, this is kind of how the uh, connectivity on the red side worked. Um, when it came to the CFK kit, basically very similar thing, except what we did was we just leveraged the connectivity from the, uh, the, the black router. So uh, at, in Alpina, which had Starlink and LTE out to a router in AWS. So we had different types of connectivity available at the edge. And then we had um, the, uh, the, the DMVPN connection come from the, the, the CFK kit um, out to its gateway that was out in Hickam. And so um, there, what we demoed was basically, let's take the CFK kit, plug it into the backside of the Juniper, um, and then you know, go, go run some tests. So the, the, the specific scenario was we established a voice call. So basically I used my phone for this. So I established my iPhone. Basically, let me go back, called into this network. Um, basically, you know, in here and then went back all the way to a phone that was sitting uh, in the kit. And then um, what we did was um, we enabled packet duplication. And so essentially the, um, the traffic was being duplicated across all available paths. So, you know, uh, LTE and then Starlink. And then we pulled the primary connectivity, which was Starlink. So no packet, uh, no packet drops, um, no, no voice drops at all. And then um, Preston asked to disable that feature. So we disabled it and we did the exact same test. So traffic were, uh, so similar to my demo, traffic preferenced a specific path. In this case, it is Starlink. We then uh, unplugged Starlink. Uh, we dropped one packet, the voice call maintained perfectly um, as it moved from one type of connectivity over to the other and then pulled the, uh, the LTE connection. Um, so essentially there's no traffic that's flowing at that point, then plugged back in the Starlink. And I think it was probably about 10 seconds or so. Um, and then the, essentially that same voice call, it didn't drop, it just you know, uh, resumed. So um, that was, that was the, the, the demonstration that we were doing at, at, at Guide 3 with this technology. And so the nice thing there was that there was no modification required to the CFK kit in order to deliver the capability. We just plugged it in and things just work. Yeah, thanks, um, thanks Rob. And you know, as, as you can see from the demo here, the secure vector routing is extremely powerful and flexible if we were to apply it with the doctrines of uh, JP3-12. And if you don't know what that is, it's the uh, doctrine a uh, joint publication for uh, doctrine and cyber operations. And so <clears throat> if we're able to even take the SVR extended to the host, uh, that would make it even more powerful so that from say Windows 10 PC, we can not only uh, handle and vector all the traffic per host leaving the PC. We can now discriminate based on uh, the individual leaving the PC. So for example, if I was on a VDI machine, I can now say, all right, hey, uh, Peter Chu's um, session needs to be inspected more carefully than say Boris's. And therefore I'm gonna re-vector um, uh, Stix's uh, packets to a special enclave where inspection could be applied. And today there is no way of discriminating based on user, uh, but now we can if we were to extend the ICD or uh, secure vector routing to the uh, host itself. So do you wanna talk a little bit about the driver, the, the identity context driver for, uh, for secure vector routing, Rob? Yeah, absolutely. So let me pull, um, and so some of the stuff I'm gonna kind of go through is a bit under NDA. Um, so please don't share it with uh, our, our competitors. Um, but you know, I walked through the idea of metadata Right, so basically the routers are exchanging context information about a session. Um, and so part of the thing that we had developed, and, and this is publicly available, you can actually go see the, the, the demo of this on, our, on the uh, 120 Technology YouTube page, is something we call the identity context driver. And so the idea was that, you know, where you have issues around, you know, DPI not being able to deliver the true context because of things like TLS 1.3 and stuff like that, what if you could get the context from the source, right? So 
There, what we do is we place a driver onto the endpoint. Um, so what that does is it's going to uh, obtain details from the system. For example, the SID, the username, the domain name, the name of the process that is actually generating each individual flow, the username, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then use uh, the, the concept of metadata to then convey that detail inside of the lead packet of each flow to the local SSR router. And so that gives you more context to make a decision about what is going on. So, you know, the router now has the context that this session was created by a specific executable on a specific device with a specific UUID by a specific user logged into a specific domain. So a lot more context than you could ever glean from just looking at the raw packets on the wire. And then we can extract that metadata and then use that to apply policy. So to do things like only allow outlook.exe to talk to exchange, to set the priority of say one user different than another. Um, also to you know, embed the context that is derived from ICD into flow records. And then one of the things that, you know, when we look at this makes a lot of sense is to actually extend this capability uh, further by leveraging the, the, the user certificates that are all over the DOD. So I'll stop here and, and see if, uh, um, you know, uh, there's any, any questions on this. I could get into uh, what we would do with with um, the the device certificates as well. Yeah, can uh, would you like run through like a use case? Yeah, yeah. So yeah. you know, um, when it comes to specific users, right? I could you know preference one user versus another. I could specify I only want to allow a certain executable to communicate to uh, a certain application. Um, so, for example, if you know I wanted to say only Outlook.exe can talk to Exchange, right? Um, if I then have a shell script attempting to communicate to the exchange server, I'm going to notice that and block it by default because it's not allowed to do so. Um, and, you know, so, so th th those are kind of some of the use cases um, that, that we see. Um, the other piece is really about, um, you know, when we look at, at some of the things for zero trust, uh, basically how you extend that user identity to, you know, in this case, the actual certificate that's on the user, right? So to use the public key that is there to take that metadata, then sign it with the private key, um, and then embed that signature into that metadata. So now I have true cryptographic uh, truth of, okay, it actually was this user because I have their metadata, I know all the context, I have their public key, I have the signature that's generated by their private that I can then verify. And then I can see, is that public certificate real? Has it been revoked? Right, and then you know, validate everything is the way that it's that it should be, and then make determinations of routing and QoS and policy based upon that. And so, like in this instance, we have a smart card, presumably a CAC. Um, we could right federate any PKI uh, to do that. We could have you know the CA of France or whatever, and we could we could back the session with their CA cryptographically. Yeah, yeah, it, 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 as, as far as I'm concerned, I, I don't care who issued the certificate. I'm just using the, you know, do I trust the CA or not, right? Um, and then if, if I do, it's really gonna come down to, you know, if there's, uh, um, you know, multiple levels of trust, right? As, as, as long as that, that chain of uh, trust can be, you know, properly validated, everything should work. Awesome. So in that example, with every time uh, a new flow is initiated, so if I hit send receive on Outlook, I'm going to have to do a, a request to the user to sign sign so that flow request. They should not have to. Uh, I don't believe that they would need to do that because the application once it is once it's opened up the API to talk to the PKCS 11 library, um, it will then persist. So basically, you'd be prompted to enter your pin, but only once. What, once per application or once per once, user once, login session? Once per, once per user login. So like when, when you log into to the machine, right, you would punch in your PIN, right? You would then be prompted again to punch in your PIN to authorize the ICD driver to um, perform signing operations using the private key that's on that smart card. And then that okay. would be, so essentially until you, you know, logged out, um, or that machine locked, you wouldn't have to then re-perform re that operation. 
So if we had a, say, <clears throat> a third party national from, say, Germany, and uh, we federated our ICAM with them, um, then this could be used um, to transport SecRel type of traffic uh, encrypted from end to end from their PC, kind of like CSFC, uh, except uh, a bit more zero trusty. Does that make sense? Is that accurate? Yeah. I'm tracking that as well. Who, who said that? Was it Jerry or? I don't know. That was Cameron. Um, I, I, I see that as an accurate assessment based on what, what I'm looking at. Yeah, there's some, there's some things that, that, that we're also investigating on how we do the um, encryption from the end host to the, the, the first SSR. So there's some, some different options that we're, uh, we're looking at there. So Robert, I have a different question. Uh, back to the, the IETF draft standard work, uh, of the things that you've talked about today, what, what's included in that draft standard? Is it, the, is it the exchange of session table information between routers? Is that effectively what's in the standard? Uh, that is what I believe is there. Um, I, I haven't read the updated version of it, but it's really about the metadata exchange, the mechanisms by which we exchange routing information. So the metadata exchange on the session side of things, as well as the, 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 the routing information exchange. And so part of that whole process of um, opening up the, as a standard, there's, there's kind of a couple like phases that one could see that um, playing out, right? So um, one of them, you know, if you open this up is, is really like what type of device could run it, right? It has to be something that keeps state, right? Um, Cause that's the way that this works. So when, we were acquired, I think it was around the, so we were acquired in like late November-ish. Um, I think it was like January or February of this year. Um, the team that has the SRX, that runs the SRX firewall code, um, they actually pulled in the, um, the code that runs uh, SVR. And so there is, I believe a beta that's starting, um, I think it's in Q4 that SRX will run the SVR code and be able to communicate essentially interoperability between an SRX firewall and then a session smart router. So to me, that was kind of the, the first um, milestone of, you know, can you take this code base, right? The mechanisms that are being used and port them over to a, a in essence, another vendor's product. And so the, the answer to that is yes. Um, and so basically the, 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 the next evolution of that would be for a third party outside of Juniper to take the draft RFC and then implement it in their own product. Is there, is there also a need for uh, a common interface to uh, the orchestrator or is that already, are you already using it like a uh, standardized SDN interface for that? So there's um, uh, open APIs to do all of the configuration that, that we do on our side. So technically you can deploy, you know, a network, you know, just like, just like this one, right? With hundreds of routers and you don't have to manage it with our orchestrator. Um, you can just manage it directly on the routers themselves. So the, the orchestration layer is not a requirement. It just makes things easier. Um, you technically can do it without it. So, um, you know, how they would be uh, implementing, uh, you know, a, a version of, of their routing protocol is, is or of, our, of our routing protocol would kind of be up to them, but the interoperability is in band. Um, there isn't any requirement. So if you had another vendor that had their own SDN thing and they had their own orchestration layer, as long as they could speak SVR, they should be able to speak to another, you know, SSR or SRX running SVR. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. But you would have to, um, you would have to then uh, externally uh, ensure that there was consistency on the policies so that you would have end-to-end -end consistency in, in transport, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay. So um, a lot of the data about how, uh, of the, uh, so the context that is being conveyed between the routers is derived by the first router. So um, that's what's being sent in the metadata. And so if we look at like, um, you know, one of the sessions and I hope we'll find one that's, that's still up and running, we're going to get a lot of details about 
um, you know, the specifics of the flow. Um, and then there's, a, there's also gonna be details about, I wanna say here, we should see details about, you know, what we actually performed um, in terms of actions to the flow. Um, and then there's there's more data that's that's not exposed directly in here. But you know um, when the when the session is arriving into the first router, it's grabbing all the context details and then conveying it on all the others. Um, and so those other routers are then validating, do I trust that router? Um, and then if it does, I'm I'm leveraging that that uh, that metadata to inform me how I should be making decisions, right? So instead of like if if you're going through the airport um, and you know. You, you went to like go through passport control and you know every single stop you had to make, you had to go through passport control again versus someone just say, oh, you're late for your flight. I'm just gonna walk you through everywhere you need to go. Um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the, the, the difference is you're not having to redo that entire process at every single hop. Well, that was a great uh, briefing, Rob. I think um, uh, there were a lot of good questions there. Um, and there's a lot of use case scenarios that we can give also to those. Uh, some of the things that we are exploring now is uh, a CSFC like functionality. If we had two layers encryption, uh, we'll say AppGate and then ICD, right? What can we do then to obviate the need for having a lot of KGs or HAPI devices on the network uh, and making this as mobile as possible for warfighters. Imagine if I had a, say, uh, a tablet that's running AppGate and ICD on the device. So I have then two layers of encryption. So I can now take this device and be sitting at any um, Wi-Fi access point to be able to get to back, back to separate information. So I can make C2 decisions in a fight as long as I have some mode of IP connectivity back home, uh, that will change the game completely in how we uh, conduct operations in the field. So thank you, Rob, for the uh, presentation. Uh, barring any uh, last minute questions, I will uh, say bid you adieu and thank you for your, uh, for your good questions. And I will post this recording to Confluence as soon as I uh, get it downloaded. So if you wanted to go back and review um, by all means, you're free to do that. And uh, if you want uh, a deeper dive conversation and we look with your team, uh, you're welcome to do that as well. And feel free to ping me on Teams or, um, or text or whatever email and uh, be happy to help you set that up. Um, <clears throat> as you're aware, the CAO's uh, office is undertaking infrastructure for what warfighter network modernization. Um, and so this is one of the key enabling technologies we're exploring. Uh, if there's something else better, we will certainly use that. Uh, but this is what we're going to MVP with for now. So uh, if you have any objections or any feedback you want to give me, by all means, now it would be a better time to do it than later. So anyway, thanks again, Rob, um, for, for the presentation. Um, and uh, unless there are any questions, uh, thank you. And um, sticks out here. Thank you, Sticks.